Okay, um, so everyone, um, we're moving on to uh, the next presentation now, um, which is going to be by uh, Rob Trigwell, who is the uh, Data Ethics and Responsibility offer, uh, Officer for DTM, based out of London, um, and he's going to be introducing an ethical framework for using models in humanitarian environments, looking at ethical frameworks for applying data science methods um, in humanitarian settings, and an overview of an interactive tool to help us as practitioners think about the ethical, technical, and practical considerations with humanitarian data science projects. I think this is a very timely um, and very sort of like important uh, discussion and trend that is emerging in humanitarian discourse. So um, Roberta, maybe you can shop, stop um, sharing your screen so that Rob can start his presentation. Thank you. Yeah, hi everyone, and thanks Bruce. So um, just whilst my presentation is loading, I just want to say that was a super interesting presentation by Roberta and, um, and Hazem. Bruce, can you, see, can you see my screen okay? Give me a thumbs up if you can see yeah. it. Uh, so, no, I wait, hold on. I yes, we can go on. Perfect. Yeah, well, yeah, thanks, Bruce. Um, yeah, hi, colleagues. So, as Bruce mentioned, uh, my name's Rob. I work for um, IOM's displacement tracking matrix. I'm in the global team and work on um, part of kind of the stuff I work on is looking at how we can better use data and technology, but in an innovative, um, also responsible way. Um, so one of the reasons uh, kind of speaking today at CCCM is because as Bruce mentioned, um, kind of this is a bit of a timely discussion in the last couple of years, just in my current role, you know, we're, 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 with DTM we're involved in kind of understanding how, when DTM can access a site, um, our, which our jobs to get population numbers, how can we, use satellite imagery to get camp-based population estimates how can we uh, do that using certain um algorithms to then that we can train to get population um estimates for say shelter numbers um or it could be how after a, a particular event a cyclone and whatnot um looking at movements of people uh, using cool detail records mobile phone records that's a proxy for mobility so um so the use of more kind of advanced data science methods beyond kind of i think it's safe to say like um, more descriptive statistics that we, that we more often see in humanitarian analysis you know with the pie charts linear charts and we've definitely seen an uptake in interest as well as users um of data um in in this in this domain so um for those that don't know the dtms the spaceman tracking matrix were iom's essentially primary data collection tool and understanding um, the number of IDPs, locations, as well as, well as migrants. Um, we try and make as much of our data, uh, non-private data online. And um, with kind of the open data movement uh, um, that the sector's adopted with availability on various portals, uh, we've seen lots and lots of kind of people ask for data over the, over the years. And, um, and, you know, 10 years ago, if you wanted maybe a data set, you'd have to be in a cluster room with a USB that you can promise doesn't have any virus on to get a particular data set. Now you can log on from wherever and download um, download data sets and make cool maps and do cool analysis. Um, and that's great uh, for the sector. Um, with that, you know, I guess kind of more, um, a wider array, a wider array of actors are now kind of um, doing similar analysis. And as any humanitarian data collector that kind of uh, publishes the data and the information you know we should be accountable to how that kind of analysis is used beyond just sharing it online so um this isn't a unique kind of something that was was specific to, to, to what the dtm colleagues were speaking to a number of the different data collectors um in this time and this was around 2018 and we thought we'd established this very very informal um, humanitarian data science and ethics group DSEG. Um, I think it's safe to say it's probably more of a network than a group, um, but it's basically um, it was established kind of with humanitarian data collectors, um, humanitarian practitioners, some of um, ethic advocates and some academics, um, some of the people behind um, say the signal code at the beginning, for example. And the idea is to basically bring um, 
bring a kind of bit of a multidisciplinary approach to how can we ethically use data um, to inform humanitarian operations. As Bruce uh, very rightly mentioned earlier, kind of as a pragmatic group, and the idea is to create any kind of guidance on this as pragmatic and field oriented as possible. And I'll, I'll get into the tool that we've de developed for that. So, um, so the discussion is a bit encompassing of um, kind of humanitarian innovation aspects, such as um, let's understand our problem first before we try and build an app for something that we may not necessarily know what the problem is for. We just um, humanitarian principles, everything that kind of defies our work. Um, I'm just going to move this. Um, data responsibility and um, the data ethics, um, AI ethics. So it's so there's an infinite amount of resources on all of those, but this kind of discussion we felt was kind of a bit of an overlapping area of them all. Um, so anyway, so back in um, uh, mid 2018, kind of throughout for the first six months, we basically the first thing we did was basically do a map and like um, what are the opportunities, what are the concerns for applying more advanced data science methods for humanitarian operations and um, kind of we sp spoke to around 30 or 40 people and five common themes were, were popping up. It was peer review um, or the lack of, so how academics may work. Um, you know, if you were to read an academic paper about I don't, uh, maybe migration forecasting using some of the data methods, it would, it would go for a rigorous peer review process. That's not necessarily the case in our sector. We don't seem to really talk about that. We don't really like to talk about margin of error and whatnot. Um, who's accountable if we're developing models and um, to maybe understand maybe if A should go to point A rather than point B, um, if the model is wrong or if we're using maybe incomplete data sets, who's accountable for that? Is it the data scientist that develop it or is it maybe the project manager that activate the project or is it the donor that paid for it? Communications, um, how do you basically uh, convene these kind of complex processes to a different audience, to affected populations, to the, um, to the supply chain team, to the uh, management team, to the donor community, to the national governments. Inclusivity, how do you make sure um, all the members of the kind of humanitarian ecosystem um, are involved and transparency. Um, so this, the initial chat was to develop a more of a, just a standard kind of technical peer review, but then we really realized that this was a kind of a, like a free pronged um, discussion where we need to consider not just the technical aspects, um, like uh, making sure the model is technically correct and is the application of ethical and going back to Bruce's point, is it practical? Um, there's also the legal aspect, but with the different kind of the fact that we're a global network, we're working, you know, GDPR is an EU thing, you've got um, different exemptions, we kind of deliberately didn't take on the legal aspect, um, so we took on the ethical, practical and um, technical. This led to this framework that you can see on your screen now, and I'll share the link to it, um, and breaking down the kind of the concept is that with any a humanitarian program that has a, a like an advanced data science methods we kind of come with these five steps of which the two the first two are very straightforward and actually non-applicable to data science in any way what number zero and that's delivery zero is the fundamentals and we didn't call it a step one because we called it as the baseline basically before we get involved in anything we need to um, understand the humanitarian principles the ethics are we being responsible um, in terms of data, um, AI ethics, human right, inc incorporating human rights into the, into the pr uh, project idea and risk mitigation. And then number uh, the, the step on top of that, with the first step was problem recognition. So basically having a good idea of what the problem is. So for example, um, we can access an area and we're trying to understand how many um, displacement sites are in said area. So rather than saying, hey, I've got someone in my team who's really good at remote sensing, how can we use it, for example? So really getting a kind of thorough understanding of the problem first, and then um, and then really breaking that down into the solution. Okay, um, can we figure out what population numbers are in an accessible area using, uh, using certain methods? And Sometimes um, in that case you can, but in, in other solutions, maybe a 
kind of a data science method may not be applicable. And then step two, three, and four, data journey, the algorithm of reliance and outputs is really then the kind of technical aspects of a, say, of a data science project. Anyway, this was all kind of the ethical framework, which I'm not really talking about. I'm just giving a bit of the history to where we come, but it was a 50 page um, kind of report that we published and it was nice, but um, we've all kind of received 50 page PDFs in our respective field missions. And we've always said, we'll read that and then probably never do. So we wanted to make something as field orientated as friendly and um, basically a really kind of simple tool that makes, makes lives easier. So we basically translated this um, into a interactive tool called the decision tree. And if you look the um, the stages, if you can see my cursor, I'm, I'm over the, the four, the five steps on the, on the left-hand column. And th these have been translated to the, to the various steps there. Um, which are the step, the key steps of the, of the decision tree with the kind of the, the debunking of the, with the separation of problem recognition first and search and solutions. Um, what this basically means is that this is basically an online tool that program teams can log on and essentially go through all aspects of the program. Um, this, is, this is basically the map of it, but it gets a bit more, um, it's, there's, a, there's a lot more kind of content on each slide. But for example, there may be a, um, I don't know, a DTM team that may be more technical in the sense of kind of data crunching and um, using GIS and remote sensing, but it may be short on some of the, some other aspects of the project. So we basically designed this route, um, which is essentially, if you were to look at all the pages of the ethical framework, all the, page, all the pages are somewhat scattered on this page that we're seeing right now. And through um, support of, a, of around about 120 different actors, right from Amazon, AWS, PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, through to UN Global Pulse and the Alan Turing Institute, we've tried to develop basically a process uh, that if someone, if a humanitarian practitioner is looking to apply kind of a data science or support their program with a data science method or model, um, but may not, um, this is, uh, this is a, a, a recommended or a thought out process of what they can do. Um, so, and this is, um, and there's no perfect order, but we basically have to put it in the flow. And you can see that we start with fundamentals, you go through the problem recognition, and then you kind of go through the suitability. And for example, there's only one bit where we put a red flag where basically if automation will not support your program, then it might not be worth it. Um, I'm quickly going to, um, just show you what this looks in in practice. Um, whoops, hopefully it's there. So this is the actual online version where you basically log on. I think we can see it, Rob. Can you see it? No, it's still on the PowerPoint. All right, let me. I think I because I swapped pages. You exit screen and share screen again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've got it. Here. So basically, this is the website, and I'll share it. And this is basically. Um, let me just go back. Um, so you basically log on and this is, this is the page you'll enter and you kind of go through and you go, you can see the, the different stages of the tree and the fundamentals is basically going to say you, in the five fundamental things that we said you need to know, it's going to say go on. So let's just say I'm an AI ethics consultant who has joined the humanitarian team. So let's just say I'm pretty sharp at this. So yeah, I'm good. Um, I have enough information. But let's just say, no, I need more information on kind of humanitarian principles. And with the schematic I just showed you, um, it was just basically what the steps were. But what the actual tree does, it brings you, it, it, we've, basically, we've basically collated all of the, a lot of resources um, that you would kind of need more information on. So if you are good on something, you can skip it and you don't see the resources. But if you want a better insight, then you don't have to then go, okay, I need to now educate myself on humanitarian principles you can basically, um, a lot of the links are here, are here for you. So we're not inventing anything new. We're just basically, we've collated all the, all the we've basically designed the process of what we think is appropriate. And then we've put it in an order and then we've basically essentially just tagged, um, tagged, tagged all the relevant links for that particular 
uh, box um, for the process. Um, so you can see on data management, um, let's just say I need some more information on human rights, and it bring, brings it up. Apologies for my, um, in a much kind of quite an easy way. In here, you can see the human rights and um, the age of artificial intelligence documents. So let's just say, and, you, and that's how you kind of go for it. I'm just going to deliberately try and get to the end of the stage. Um, and then stage complete. And then and then we go on to the next stage. I'm just going to take us back to the presentation I was on. But it's, it's, it's basically really straightforward. So the decision tree now that should be back on my screen, um, you can essentially go through that with the program team and any, um, I, you know, it's, there's so many steps in this project, there's so many considerations from how to get consent to data processing to team diversity that maybe not one team would be an expert in all of the, I think the 67 identified steps, which is totally fine. But if someone goes through this, goes through this pro goes through the tree, then at least they'd be confident that maybe they've thought about some of the, um, some of the potentially kind of pitfalls that people could get caught out for on designing this. Yeah, we, we've really thought about how to build an algorithm, but maybe we didn't um, consider data access um, of where the data was collected for. So we kind of kind of put a spotlight in one part of the country and, and, um, and another part of the country is going to be in the shadows, in the data shadows, I should say. And yeah, so this, so this was so this is just a few kind of print screens of, of some random pages throughout the tree. This is the data check, um, bias check, and again you can we just pick on some of the main points of this particular of whatever the slide is showing in an order. Of, so just something to spark the, for the team to think about this: have we have we thought about response bias? Have we, have we thought about historical bias on when we, when we are doing the bias check? Um, Team diversity. Have we thought about team diversity um, at any point throughout throughout the process? Um, and then algorithm checks. So, and this is a nice example here because uh, the five ten red cross. So, if you're developing an algorithm, um, I don't know. Yeah, going back to the example um, about and then um, doing population estimates using shelter counts from satellite imagery. Uh, the reason why I use that example is quite is, is quite a common one. Um, you can actually then run the algorithm through the red ten, the, the five ten, sorry, red um, red cross ethical error checker, which sort of kind of branches off and then branches back to us um, to make sure the actual um, the algorithm has gone through the key check. So basically, when there's a better tool on a particular page for our tool, we basically send you there um, because again, this is more just of a collation of a process than anything invented new. Um, and then on the website, um, so basically once you've gone through, you can complete and so, um, something I should have said at the beginning, at, you could, at the beginning of the tree, when you log on, you can actually create an account, you can create a project. Um, so forecasting displacement in Southern Ethiopia was an example. And then you can run that through and then um, that will also uh, build a reposit repository on the website. This is something we're developing now and kind of you can get like a, a completion certificate um, just to really, so for example, the Humanitarian Grand Challenge, I think it's hosted by the Canadians, uh, they've now requested that any humanitarian project with an AI component to go through the tool, to go through this tool, the DSEC tool. So if anyone is kind of thinking about that, this is just, it's not, it proves the wrong word, um, it's way too much of a word, but it's just demonstrates that someone or a program team has thought about this extremely complex process and all and try to mitigate some of the uh, potential risks that that may come out of um of applying kind of data science and ai um for our operations we work with extremely vulnerable populations we we work with kind of in resource um you know short context we need to make the most of it so have we kind of basically like are we trying to run our program as, as well as possible um yeah so back to that and then i think that's about it to be honest um yeah i'm not sure if anyone has any questions i'll, I'll stop sharing my screen and i'll quickly post a few of the the links i've talked about in in the chat right now thanks rob that was um that was really interesting i think the thing i like i like most about that is that um 
apart from just being sort of like a, a workflow to get certification to show that your research is sort of following all of the ethics, if you your program doesn't have those components already sort of integrated you know, into its workflow, it also works as a checklist in order for you to build up the components you need in order to be able to research data and analyze data ethically. Um, I was wondering, like, in the one of the first few slides, you said you'd done you'd done quite a lot of um, desk review of uh, methodologies of different reports. I mean, without maybe naming organizations, like how many or what portion of, um, you know, analyses produced by humanitarian agencies do you think have not really been following all of the ethical guidelines, you know, that have sort of been outlined in your in your checklists in your in your workflow. Um, yeah, geez, I'm not sure because so, so basically, um, yeah, it, I, I'm not I'm not really sure. Like you know, you have kind of you know um, some of the the advocates of say the ICRC on data protection, you know, the excellent resources. It's just that, that you know in. The reason why we made it kind of a, a flow, um, basically, you know, like we work in camps, you know, if you're going to build latrines, you can follow sphere standards in the digital world, in the digital part of the humanitarian community we work in, there's, you know, there isn't the same kind of like standards. So there's always a way to do everything a bit differently. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, as I said, we're not a group or a network, like, you know, it's not up to us to develop those standards or is it I don't, I don't know but we didn't think it was we were like okay we're just going to basically provide a, a route that we think is a good route and people can follow it and yeah as you said you know yeah um, you always know you, you like the more you get into something you the more you realize you don't really know as much as you thought about it and so if you're you know if you've just seen a google or a microsoft ai for good ground i'm sure many of us saw you know they release you think, oh, you know, I'm going to do this. And then you actually realize that if you're going to do it properly, it's incredibly intensive, resource intensive. Mm -hmm. So we just basically, um, we wanted not a hand-holding tool, but we just wanted to, you know, try and facilitate innovation and make people innovate and progress, but actually think about, you know, some of the risk. So it's, yeah, it, and there's a lot to read and there's a lot to educate yourself on. So it's, it's hard to, it's hard to say who who has and who hasn't followed it because I'm. It's not necessarily like this could be. It's. I'm not saying it's the perfect tool, but I'm saying through like two and a half years of work, we kind of figured out that if I was to run a project, if I was to develop a project and run it through that, and a, a donor or someone was to ask me like, have we tried four about the steps? I would. I can say I've probably given it like a valiant effort. Um, yeah. But in the absence of minimum standards. In, in kind of the digital world of, of the humanitarian sector, it's, it's hard to say, it's hard to say that, if that makes sense. Yeah. How far behind is the humanitarian sector in terms of uh, ethics when, in, in the digital world compared to places like the private sector? Um, the private sector, for sure. Like, I mean, just before this, I was on the, uh, we, IOM are part of the, um, the UN wide kind of team to develop UN standards and ethics. And we just got presented by the EU and the EU are very advanced in this. The, you know, standards are a way to build trust. Um, and, you know, that's how the IEE um, standards agency kind of tries to build trust by putting standards in. And I think, you know, sphere standards are a way that the humanitarian community adopt. They almost self-regulate, donors ask about them. You know, the humanitarian community in the digital area, we don't, really have that we're talking about it a lot particularly with the data responsibility stuff um but at the same time you know i've presented in other sectors and um and they seem even more behind us it's 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 a, it's a tricky one you know but i am um, but in terms of the data responsibility work the work that archer have been doing in the past couple of years at a sense of humanitarian data icrc um you know it's i think there's the safeguarding around data um the recognition that we can't just build apps and platforms we have to think about the ethics and kind of the impact of of the innovations um that's definitely kind of caught up in discussions in the last couple of years i think harvard signal code was a good 2018 publication i think was an excellent kind of um kickstart to that so maybe not innovation for innovation's sake but in helping people innovate appropriately and ethically essentially yeah there's a question in the chat here. Um, maybe you can you can answer um, from Omar, where he says the the community gets fatigue um, from the large number of data collection 
exercises by many teams for different purposes, could CCCM unify and standardize data collection processes and update it on a timely basis and share the specific data according to the needs instead of being repetitive? So I guess the question is, is also the fact that we may, you know, assessment fatigue from populations, which I think humanitarian agencies contribute to quite significantly, a component of this framework? As I have you collected this information before, are you going back to the community and asking the same questions again? I think I think it goes back to step one of the decision tree is yeah. problem recognition. Like what what what's our problem? Like um, it's so easy to just, you know, to say, oh, we need this data for that, but you actually what's our genuine problem? Do we actually need to collect that data? Like do, do we, it. yeah, it, does it already exist? Like um, so, you know, I think that's what I meant earlier by the problem recognition and search and solution stage is not applicable to data science. It's applicable for all the, we don't critically assess, ask, um, I've, I was in, yeah, I mean, I won't give an example, but I was in this uh, in a context last month and we were talking about registration and the critical question is what do we actually need to do with miles before we even start to talk about whether we need to do registration or not. And I think a lot of data collection initiatives need to be doing a little bit more critically like what actually do we need to know sorry and then do we have the data and then also a little bit more talking about kind of interoperability in the sense that if agency a is going to collect the data set let's make sure it connects and talks to um to agency b so um because there's lots of data out there but sometimes they're all swirling around independently and not quite talking to each other so I think um, I think you know if if agencies do go ahead, I, I agree with the comment of the colleague who made that. Um, but if we do go about, we kind of need need more critically assess like really why we're doing it and really what information do we need and don't. Um, there's a lead, um, the British Red Cross used a term called like data minimization or lean data, and is really just ju really just collecting the data we need at a real minimum level. Um, so collect better data but less of it, um, essentially. And then making sure the um, the metadata behind it like talks to each other, so different data sets can be used and kind of mosaic. So we actually have to collect, so we can get more of the data we have rather than keep on collecting and collecting and collecting and collecting. Because at the end of the day, it's a burden on the affected populations and it's a burden in terms of resources. I agree. Thanks. And also maybe if we can move past the the idea that. Um you know, the, the act of collecting information and putting your logo on it becomes valuable in the humanitarian industry um, and rather to share information and have good information processes uh, and assessment repositories at a response level could, um, could mitigate against that. Um, Rob, we're gonna have to move on to the next um, presenter, but thanks very much for your presentation. That was really interesting. Um, if anyone else has questions for Rob, um, if you're gonna stick around, maybe you can ask them in the chat. Um, thanks a lot, Rob, that was great. Pleasure, uh, thanks, thanks guys. Thanks, all. Cheers. Um,